All right. Hello, everybody. Um, I, this is my second uh, chat of the night. And what better than to cap it off with the wonderful Janie Words. How are you tonight? I am fantastic. I'm so glad to hear it. There's, It's funny because when I have a chat like somebody like you who's been writing for a while and with wonderful people and you've got that experience, it's hard to know where to start. Um, what aspects to dive into, but I go to the same answer for me every time. And, and I kind of just, what do I want to know um, from Janny? And and what am I after? I'm after learning on this channel. I'm always in the pursuit of knowledge. And I feel like he's got a lot of that. And I'm going to try and poke you a little bit and uh, get some of it out of you. Um, I had brothers. You're going to have to poke pretty hard. <laughs> I love that. I was, I was telling Janny guys before, I popped in. I said, "I'm sorry. I was I was only in the, the backstage for like a minute, two minutes before this, and uh, having to put the kids to bed." And she was telling me how you're a, a, a sibling of how many? Five kids. There were five of us in the family. Yep, I'm in the middle. So, from that perspective, do, were you um, thankful for multiple uh, siblings? Did it help in some ways uh, as far as growing up and certain aspects like sharing and not everything <laughs> good luck no it was crazy it was chaos because two older brothers they beat the hell out of you from above and the two younger sisters tattle on you from below so it makes you very crafty and very good at, at the comeback and being sneaky you know revenge all that stuff so you know i think it's a good place for a writer to be because First of all, to escape the chaos, I read a lot of books. Mm, oh, my gosh. I'm so excited. I've got some wonderful questions because even just from that, I know they're going to be wonderful. So I, I kind of just wanted to start with uh, what I've heard the most about. Uh, and it's really long series you've got. And it's coming to an end. The Wars of Light and Shadow series. Um, would you give us a touch of like what uh, a little bit of an overview? I know there's many books in this series. Um, but a general overview and uh, like the subgenre, intended audience type thing, like age specifically. It isn't age specific, though. It was not aimed at teens. Okay. It was actually designed so that you could read it in any decade of your life and the story would change because your life perspective will change what you're seeing. This, is, this was not my first rodeo. I wrote four novels before I ever decided to publish anything. And those things are sitting in the file cabinet and I hope they are never dug up. <laughs> they were awful. Um, and I wrote a bunch of other books that I published first because I felt I didn't have the life experience to tackle this one, even though I had the idea for it in 1972. So I started out having read Tolkien not to write and copy token at all it was more token kicked open the doors and said to me you can create your own world you don't have to write mythology you don't have to stick to fairy tales fantasy could be entirely your own build so i started out going yeah i want to do this i want to build my own world and i want to take what i hate the most about this one and fix it sort of sort of in the process, I realized that I didn't have enough knowledge to do this. So I set about doing things for real in real life to get the hands-on experience so I could actually take you there so that I would take you beyond the armchair of a read and actually put you in the real life predicament that the characters go through. So this took me offshore sailing. This took me traveling all over Europe. I went to Russia, I went to Africa. I witnessed all kinds of things firsthand. I did wilderness travel. I did Outward Bound. The list goes on and on and on. I rode horses. I took fencing. So I had that hands-on feel for what could be done and couldn't be done. The next thing I did was I realized I was going to be mixing and matching time periods because of the way technology is permitted or not permitted by certain restrictions in this world. The way the world itself is constructed prevents certain things from happening. Mixing and matching time periods forced me to mix and match periods of history because nothing would have developed on the same time scale as our world did. So I had a sailing and sailboats, for instance, ocean going travel would have 
advance further, but wars would have stalled at the point where cannons and gunpowder came in. And if you read the books, you'll see the reasons why. So in order to mix and match the historical periods and again, make it believable, I started doing research and I read hundreds of books back when you had to do books. There was no internet search. There was no Google. There was no wiki. There was nothing like that. I was literally getting books out of universities and having them shipped here, Federal Express, to read them. So I did research on war, beginning with um, just before the Romans and all the way up to when gunpowder really started making a difference. And just as I was doing this research, I saw a docudrama called Culloden, and it was done in black and white. It was historically a recreation or a reenactment of the Battle of Culloden Field. And it ripped the heart out of me because it was so brutally honest. And I walked out of that thing completely knocked flat. And I realized our history is written by the victor. Our entertainment glorifies war. Our news lies about what happens. People come back from these wars and they're completely wrecked mentally. They're destroyed. The inhumanity that happens is so visceral and so real and solves nothing. And I realized that the books we read, the news we watch, the history is a lie. Mm. That's, that's Wars tough, never right? solved anything. It, every war ever was a massacre. It was either unequal numbers or one commander was more superior or the ground was, I mean, it was every war ever was a massacre. And my fury just towered that fantasy was the biggest culprit of all. Mm. All the books finish with the wonderful battle that solves everything. And I said, I'm going to deconstruct that. And this was back when that was not done. So the Wars of Light and Shadow is not just a deconstruction of war. It's a deconstruction of capitalism. It's a deconstruction of colonialism back before that was even a thing. Yeah, It was a deconstruction of everything I hated about common beliefs and what people feel the world is. And the mistakes that we keep making over and over and over again. And no matter how many times history tells us this doesn't work, we repeat it. Mm. So there's a story. You can read this for entertainment. You can read it for every reason in the book, but there are underlying things that are going to punch the guts out of you because the tropes that you expect are not going to happen in the way that fantasy generally handles them. So it's multi-layered, multi-angle. It's going to keep revising what you think you know because what you think you know is only a matter of perspective. And each time that ex perspective expands, your view of what came before is going to change. I absolutely love that um, what well, you went into some of, uh, you, you escaped. You, watch, or you read a lot of books. You found something that you wanted to change with the, the way that you were going to write. Um, and then you found a cause uh, that kind of propelled you through um, and was part of that passion for you. And I can tell, I can hear it. Um, it's something important to you. Um, that's amazing. Uh, so I love when, and, and I didn't know this about myself until recently. Um, I've, I was always intimidated by certain um, novels or writers. And it, the fact was that I was being challenged um, I think that's probably my favorite thing now. And I would say that your prose, as beautiful and poetic, it, it challenges me in a way that, um, in the best way possible. So what I mean by that is, as I'm reading, it's not something, you, so let's just, we'll say it this way. You have those cozy reads and you can fly through those and you don't really have to sit and kind of think about the aspects or themes or topics that come up in the book too awful much. I like when a book, an hour after I've sat it down, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I'm glad that I was 
digesting that a little bit afterwards um, because it furthered that theme for me. And when I read your prose, it's a lot like that. It's very rewarding. Um, how long have you been doing the writing thing? How long have you been writing? Probably since I was about 16. But before that, I read the library. I read book after book after book before science fiction and fantasy were readily available. Before the mass market paperback was a huge thing. Every book came out was in hardback and you went to your local library and I would check out eight, 10 books a week and I would read them under the covers with a flashlight and get screamed at by my parents. <laughs> I would read them in school. I would get screamed at by my parents and I also would go and escape in the woods. So I was such a combination of, of being a bookworm, but also a hands-on person that liked to be outside and like to do things. Um, so it's an odd mix of experience. The vocabulary I have people go, Oh yeah, you must use a reference book for all of that. No, I read a lot of books. I read books before the news dumbed down the prose. Mm. I have that vocabulary because I read books and I wanted to deliver in the wars of light and shadow in particular, an experience that takes you there and the prose will force you to slow down and become immersed. You're mm. going to walk away from it with an experience and it will not be forgettable. So if you're looking for an escape read, if you're looking for something where you don't have to think, if you're looking for something where the edges are sanding off and you can be comfortable, you're gonna bounce off. You're gonna bounce off hard because this book is gonna force you to walk in the character's shoes in every possible way. And it's going to deliver the actual feeling of the experience of going offshore in a boat or going out in the woods or living with people you don't understand or making that mistake that's going to sear you with regret for the rest of your life. I'm not going to let you walk away scot-free with this one. And it will make you think it is designed to take you and, and deliver an expansion of what you think about what you hear and see from there forward. Just exactly as I don't feel that the news delivers the whole story. This is I, a book that's going to deliver you the whole story and it's not always going to feel good. Mm. And I, I think a lot of people can relate to that because yeah, it, it really ties back to, I like what you said. It makes it forces you to slow down and, and really digest the prose. And I think to get that rewarding outcome, um, you know, as you know, me as a reader, I, I search for that. Uh, it comes more rewarding through that type of prose for me personally. Um, is it safe to say that you've been wanting or you, that you wanted to write from a very young age? So, um, uh, no, actually I wanted my freedom. Okay. I wanted my freedom. I did not want to be dictated to. I did not want to be stuck in a traditional job. I did not want to live a regimented life. I did not want to have people telling me what the heck to do. So, this being a writer and an illustrator allowed me to do whatever I wanted and bring it back into the books, bring it back into and share it with other people, deliver you the experience that I just had. So I got to indulge my curiosity every which way but loose and use every scrap of it. And I will emphasize that I'm very frustrated because I don't like a one faceted book. I don't like grim dark. I don't like cynicism. I think the death of hope is actually the biggest evil the world has because the minute you get cynical, you've given up. Ooh. You've given up that anything can change, that anything good can come out of this. You've handed your power off to don't bother. So I want a book that gives you the full spectrum. It's going to give you the beauty and the pain. It's going to give you the growth. It's going to give you the expansion. It's going to hand you a solution for every grinding misery that occurs to these characters, it's going to transcend. And that's the kind of story that I want to write. Not one that's a dead end and say, let's all commiserate and feel sorry for ourselves. And let's, you know, let's walk through this experience and come out the other side with a changed opinion or a changed viewpoint or build on what's happened and reach for something bigger and better. 
So a full spectrum book has the beauty as well as the grim. And mm. I will pull the stops in both directions. I have to say, as somebody who likes a darker read, I have to 100% agree with you that it, uh, so I like the darkest of books, but if, but there has to be, so, for instance, um, I'll use an example, Mike Shackles, um, of course, I, I do this all the time. I, I'm like so familiar with the book and then I try to think of it just completely. Uh, book one of uh, his series, any, it's really dark, but there's these moments uh, and these possibilities of hope. If, if I'm reading something and it, that's not a possibility, things are just ending. Let's, like you said, let's sit around and, and, and feel sorry for ourselves and nothing constructive can really be um, gained from that, in my opinion. So uh, yeah, we are the dead, Ryan. Thank you, brother. Uh, it's really good. It's dark, but there is hope. And I, I feel that, that for me to finish a book personally, there has to be, even if it's uh, grim dark. I feel that you can't retreat into saying when something is that grim, it's just realistic. Because if you look at the world that we live in, you have the evilest of things happening, I know, because I volunteered for search and rescue for 10 years. I've seen what the evil people can do to each other. You have that, but you also have the Mother Teresa's. You have the wars and the battle and the horrible things the news is delivering us today. Where, you know, There's some really, really grim and ugly stuff going on, but you also have what the arts are doing. You also have the incredible strength of the human spirit when people transcend their limits. So it isn't realistic to say that there is no beauty or there is no, or there is no hope or there is, there is always a solution, even if you don't know it, even if you don't have the imagination to picture it, that just means your imagination is limited. So set yourself free and say, there will be something that I can do here that I don't know yet and leave that door open. There needs to be a million trillion more Janny words in this world with that attitude. I love that. Absolutely. Like to my core, to my values, I appreciate everything that you just said because, uh, well, I'll, I'll tell you personally, one of the things I'm teaching my four-year-old is that it feels really good to uh, give. Uh, it, it feels nice to receive but it feels great to give. And that's something that I wanted to, well, teach all of my kids. And now I'm getting the opportunity to where that might make sense to him. Um, and so I use an example of uh, if he had an extra piece of candy, maybe he want to make his brother's day and give him it and, instead of him eating it. Um, but it just plays back to if you don't have a realistic sense of hope, um, and there always is, there's that upside all the time. And I love that you said that. And that that is important to you. And yeah, but your you know, how many times do you get it beaten out of you? Shut up and put up. Ooh. You're powerless. Don't change this. Don't even think you can change this. Conform, 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 conform. But you don't change things by conforming. You never do. And I think one of the most valuable things that I ever received from my father was he didn't tell me, no, you can't do this. He never said to me, we can't afford this. Shut up and put up and, and put your dreams aside. No, he said to me, show me a way that you can responsibly make this happen. Mm. Show me that you can responsibly do this yourself. So I earned the money. I paid for my own pony at 13 years old. I supported that horse. I had to sell her when she got too sick or something and I couldn't pay the vet bill, mm. but he never slammed the door. He never said, no, he said, show me how you can do this responsibly. And if I could come up with a plan and I could pull it off, then he would say, yes, go for it. How many parents dare to do that? And so I think that really shaped an attitude of the world's not going to hand it to you, but you can find a way to teach yourself or figure out a way to earn this or figure out a way to make it happen on your own. And you might fail and you might fall down and you might lose what you gained because you didn't couldn't quite hold it. But that's life. Ooh, that is that exactly is. life. And he couldn't provide all 
five of us with every bit of our dreams. He couldn't say to my brothers, when you're 16, I'll give you a car. No, he said, figure out a way to do it responsibly. And my brothers had cars, okay? But they did it themselves. I have to say, I, I respect that whole story so much. I really do because... Um, what I see a lot to, of today, and, and this, this has a lot in relation to the writing and, and reading we do today uh, in, in modern books, um, there's too much going on in our world. Uh, and I think too many people have opinions. And I'm what I'm getting to is when I sit down and read a fantasy book, right, it's not going to be full of politicians in our world. Um, religion as far as i'm a religious guy but i'm I'm just saying it i get enough of our world stuff that i don't want it in my books but i like when i get values or morals that are important to me very much on the same line as what you said that your dad was about i think that's really important and um p- putting that in your your work your babies uh is, is really incredible to me and i think ryan skeffing has one of the best uh questions I think I've ever seen. Are there any characteristics of humanity that you are consistently drawn to and enjoy writing? I think um, we all like to see the underdog win or we like to see the fish out of water find their place because, you know, we're all born into this world as fishes out of water. We're all born into this world as unshaped individuals. And we're all dragged down by all the people that say, be safe and join the pack. Do it my way and be disappointed because I was disappointed. I didn't dare to step outside and reach for anything. And so if any one thing means the most to me, it's don't let other people put a sock around you. Mm. Totally don't. They all want to because they're all living where their dreams were crashed or they bought somebody else's lie that said, you can't do this. Mm. Find a way. I love that. But it's a constant fight because you're always being criticized. You're always being told, don't bother. I mean, I was told you can't write and illustrate books. You just can't do that. You you should pick one, one or the other. You know, you need to focus, you need to, you can't go and ride horses professionally, or you can't go and play musical, you know, you can't do all this stuff. And it's like, why not? Well, you proved why not? them wrong. So it isn't so much proving them wrong. It's we're growing up in an internet age where everybody's opinion is in your face. You can't pick up a book without getting everybody's opinion about it before you've even read one word. Mm. You see their star rating, you see the reviews, you see the people talking about it. So the pressure to be part of the crowd, the pressure to read what everybody else is reading, the th- the pressure to pick up that book that's got all the hype is on you all the time and it's depressing. I didn't grow up that way. I grew up browsing the bookstore and if I wanted to read a book, I didn't ask somebody what to read. I didn't say what, I didn't need an opinion. I picked up the book and opened it up and looked at a paragraph or three and said, does this interest me or not? Me and the book, nobody else, not a rating, not a star, not a review, nothing. And I, I prefer to read that way. I don't I want that. to read the blurb. I don't want somebody's opinion. I want to form my own. But we're living in a world that's so noisy, it's mm-hmm. very hard now to have your own opinion because there's 50 people objecting. And and though, oh, I agree. So my, and a lot of people are scared of that. And, and lots of people lose their jobs or... It's Uh, terrifying. You get dogpiled. If I was to say what book I read that, you know, recently that I hated, if that's one of the internet's fantasy babies, I'm going to get dogpiled. I'm going to get drummed out. And then people are going to say, well, if you hate the book I love, I'm not buying your work. Well, I don't want to be that negative anyway. If I don't like a book, that's, that's between me and the book. I will talk about the books I love because I want to draw attention to those, not what I didn't like. That's for somebody else. But it's very hard to have your own opinion in this internet age. And even if you say nothing, people assume, well, silence is complicity. Well, not necessarily. What I do, what I believe might just be my own business. 
Yeah, I think that something different from when I grew up and when you grew up is that. Um, well, there's a couple things. I wish that I would have been interested in reading, um, writing as, as a younger man because I didn't find that passion until I was 29. Um, so when I hear the stories such as yours and how big that is, uh, or it was and still is in your life, um, it's really inspiring. And Bryce from Sh uh, Shelf Centered, who is a huge fan of yours, always talks about your work. Um, and I watched his wonderful short today of the coffee mug um, that was sent out. And it's beautiful. Uh, he says, love Janie Wirtz. She can do everything. No, I don't dance and I don't play golf. <laughs> golf is too boring, you know. I mean, really hit a ball and chase it. And then get in a little car and chase the ball. And, you know, no, 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 no. I, I I think that golf is definitely for those uh, certain people, and I happen to be one. I enjoy it a little. I suck at it. Don't get me wrong. I'm terrible, but that's what's beautiful. And um, if you love it, that's fine. But you know, when you, when they say Jenny Wirtz does everything, no, I do not play golf. <laughs> um, but that's that's the beautiful thing. Instead of uh, be, me being drawn to those things that make people different, right? I embrace those. Culture is something I found through this channel. And culture can mean a state over or countries over or, you know, oceans in between us. What you do different than what I do is very interesting to me. And I think it brings us all closer together in the end. Um, I like I like what you're about, Jenny. Um, <clears throat> so let me tell you something. I once went to Russia. I went to Russia to see artwork because. The Russians looted everything in World War II. Yeah. And you could go and see 14 Rembrandts in one room, in one museum in Russia, and nowhere in Europe could you do that. And the museums in the Kremlin, before they got looted, which they have been looted, had entire rooms full of things that Europe had lost because they melted down all of their stuff or sold it because of wars or... And the Russians still had all these things from Europe that they were sent as ambassadorial gifts. And they were all there in the museums. I mean, it was like a fairy tale. You could see art there that was like nowhere in the world. And I came back from Russia furious with people in Western culture that could do nothing but complain about variety they didn't like this. They didn't like that. They didn't like all the advertising. They didn't like, and let me tell you, going to see Russia in 1974, right after Nixon reopened the borders there, was like stepping into an anesthetic. The state decided who could be an artist. There were two factories that canned all the food. They had no competition, no advertising. The labels of the food was like pink and gray or yellow. It was like walking in a, in a store was like being blind and deaf. Wow. It was just so monotone. There was no, and coming back here, it was like, okay, you walk down an aisle in a supermarket here and it's just absolutely noisy with color, everything trying to scream and grab your attention. But it's like, damn it, you've got a choice. You've got all this variety. You have a choice. You can pick and choose what you do in your life here. So I saw what that culture did to people's minds, and it was numbing. Communism is just awful. cannot imagine what would happen if one person said, my way or the highway. The variety it takes, the deadness, the creativity that just withers. So I will take our, our noisy, loud, unpleasant, sometimes nasty culture any day of the week because you can choose how you navigate through it rather than having no choice at all. I like that. And what I hear from you is you're grateful. And I think that um, thinking of those qualities, and I do this quite frequently, and it, it aids my life. Um, for instance, I, I, I was griping about buying gas the other day. It's one of those things you feel like you're just burning money. But spend a week unable, like like you don't have a car, right? You're very willing to pay for that gas. You, you are then grateful. And, and you're really hitting home that same message um, with that story of Russia. Because, yeah, the year that you went over was a right after a lot of turmoil, um, a, a big change in that country. And um, 
I also love that part of America. It's like we have that choice to do what we want. I mean, with certain limitations, obviously, that need to be there. Um, but I like that message a whole lot, Danny. Um, so I know you read a lot of books and you loved this freedom it brought, uh, brought you, the escapism. You're under your your blankets with, with the light. I love that. Who are some specific authors uh, that did the, the, some influencing on you and the way that you write? There are thousands of them. I, would love I to read my you. father's books. I read all of his thrillers. I read all of my brother's books. I read Walter Farley's Black Stallion when they wouldn't let me into the teen section of the library when I was in like second grade. They said, you can't have these books. So I'd walk to the library after school and get them anyway, or I'd filter them out of my brother's room. I read everything I could get my hands on. So my influences come from everywhere. They come from Dick Francis mysteries. They come from older fantasy, newer fantasy. They come from Roger Zelazny. They come from Dorothy Dunnett. They come from, who's the guy, Joseph Kessel, who wrote The Horseman. Don't watch the movie, read the book. It's phenomenal. Um, it, they come from every which way that I could grab. There's There's some genres I don't care for as much as others, but my reading taste was very, very wide and still continues to be very wide. So the influences are so many, it's like a melting pot. That's amazing. Because what I hear is uh, it's not just reading either or writers. It's it's going to the supermarket. You take a lot of influence from many different areas, uh, which I can only imagine how much that impacts and aids in your illustration. The talent, J Janie, you have to... You have to share some of that with us. You're just hogging all that talent. No, no, no. Talent doesn't exist. Desire exists. Desire creates talent because you develop your brain to produce talent. Desire is what keeps you practicing mm. and repeated practice creates the ability to do what you want to do. And how much desire do you have that brings you back day after day after day? Mm. Don, one of Don's art teachers said the first thousand are the hardest. Uh -huh. So really, talent is training your brain. And yes, the younger you start, the quicker you get there. But frankly, your brain doesn't stop developing just because you're older. It just takes a little longer to regrow the connections to do it. Because when you're young, you're eliminating connections. When you're older, you're, you're producing them. Mm. Because you're born with, with infinite connections and you eliminate the ones you don't use, okay? So it's a little harder to learn when you get older, but practice makes perfect. So I will argue to the to the mat that talent has zero to do with it. Desire is everything. Mm, I like that a lot. And we've got some very literal terms here, so free. Well, thank you. We have neuroplasticity, um, mm -hmm. plasticity, which... Look it up, guys. It's very cool how our yep, brain it works. goes against the myth. It goes against what everybody wants to tell you. But you know what? You don't have to listen to those jerks. They mm. stopped short and they said, I give up. <laughs> you don't have to. I love it. I absolutely love that. Um, so, yeah, I wanted to do this. So you, you may have to spend years practicing to get good enough to be worth somebody else's time paying attention to what you're doing. I'm not going to say they're shortcuts. They're not. Mm. But talent stems from desire. I think that how much passion do you have? I think that if and so we'll say a hobby, if I start looking for shortcuts, then I've told myself mastering this completely has isn't important enough to me to uh, to, to deem this a passion or, or what have you. Um, I really agree with that. And I think that uh, so we'll, we'll use tennis. The best tennis players don't practice every now and then. It comes from that desire, which creates practice, and, and and they just get better over time due to that desire, which leads into a, a million different things. Um, that's a wonderful point. And uh, Ryan says, Tony Robbins says, genius is found in passion. I like the word desire as well. I think they speak to the same um, realm, if you will. Uh, wonderful. Passion to me has got to be rooted in enthusiasm enthusiasm that is genuine you can't fake it 
because if your enthusiasm is faked, if it isn't really rooted in the core of your being, you're going to get bored. Then you're going to look for the shortcuts. You're not going to want to take the time. Everything else is going to procrastinate and get in the way of it. So the enthusiasm is what keeps you coming back. And the enthusiasm that's real is natural. The problem that we have is education system, older people, peers who are disappointed, angry, and hateful can deter you and smother that enthusiasm. And you have to find a way to reawaken it. And sometimes it can be buried pretty deep. Yeah, I absolutely, I totally agree with that. So looking at, so Jenny not only writes these wonderful and often really sizable uh, books, but, and I, I didn't know this at first about you, uh, that you were also your, you know, you, you do your illustrations. I think that is absolutely wonderful um, to ride Hell's Chasm. And then on the back, you've got these wonderful pictures. And how does that, how does that start for you? So. Oh, you it was simple. When I was growing up, everything looked like Conan. Mm. And I didn't want characters that were Conan. <laughs> Excuse me, tits and butt did not. <laughs> no. <laughs> No, swords and blood and monsters. I, I don't get me wrong. I absolutely think Frank Frazetta was a genius. I've seen his paintings. I've seen his originals. Mm -hmm. He could knock it out of the part. The man was an artistic genius. So I admire his work. But when I picture my characters, they don't look like that. Sure. So I said, I'm going to write these books and I don't want that kind of cover. I so, really honestly don't want that kind of cover. So I sat down and took what little drawing ability I had and developed the crap out of it until I could do my own. So when you write a book, are you finished with the book before you do any sort of illustration? No, sometimes I'll do a painting and then I'll come first and I'll go, what the heck is this character doing here? Mm. Cycle of Fire was exactly that. I sat down to paint a picture of a wizard and I stuck him in a, in front of a major storm that I'd watched come in over Nantucket Island one year. Wow. And I took uh, one of my landlord's hawks that he caught in the backyard because it was killing his chickens. It was a one-eyed goshawk. It was starving. So here he is manning this hawk in the background, just, you know, out my window like they did in the Middle Ages because he had hawks. He did falconry. I used to have to fetch his hawks out of the trees when they would hang up their dresses. So I combined all these elements in a painting. And I said, who is this guy and what's he doing here? And I said, well, he must be a wizard and he's probably calling the storm and the hawk is part of this. And there was the whole book, trilogy, right off that. I can tell that so So many... sometimes a painting comes first, not always. So sometimes it just really just depends. Sometimes you could write a book, then come up with it or pull your inspiration from an illustration you do. I love that. Um, Hearing that quick story, I can hear all of those memories that you pulled in. And, and, and you're very familiar with each one of those memories. That was very cool to hear. Um, absolutely. And, uh, but to me, I, I draw stick figures, and, and even those are bad. And, and I've actually practiced a little bit. So to you paint, right? Yeah, oils. Oils. I, I, I totally look up to that. Um, yes, R.H. Snow, she says, ah, so much greatness on tonight. And uh, you illustrate too. So she is also an illustrator. And again, anybody who can write, that's amazing. That's like a superpower to me, but also to do your illustrations, whole nother level. Well, um, see, I grew up next to the Brandywine Valley, and that's where Howard Pyle taught N.C. Wyeth and all those guys to paint, and all their originals were right there. I mean, I well, stood at, at 14 years old looking up those all those paintings for Treasure Island. Very influential. And, uh -huh. and, had... and there's a writer illustrator right there. So nobody, you know, there was the example right in front of me. So when they said, oh, you can't do this, I'm going to hell. <laughs> Watch me. I like that. Yeah. Absolutely lo love that. Um, so when you're in the grind, say you're in the middle of writing a novel and uh Tell us a little about your, your process. Are you a pantser, an outliner, a little bit of both? And do you do the word count goal like per day? No. Okay. 
I don't like regimentation of any kind. Now, I do believe that you got to sit down and do the work, but spontaneity is important. You have to listen to your impulses. And mm -hmm. if, if you absolutely feel like you've got to go outside because it's such a beautiful day, you need to take a walk, then something inside you is telling you what to do. So I'm not talking about procrastination that is shoving everything you possibly can in front of something that you don't want to do. I'm talking about your inner impulse that says you need to do this now. Discipline is important. Mm. You don't always get the idea that you want when you want it. But there's something called open focus. And this is a fact. You can sit in a chair and make your body very, very still. And guess what? That freezes your brain. And you'll hear people say all the time, well, the minute I got up from the chair and had to go do an errand, then the idea was right in my face. Well, because you have to move. When you move, it opens your focus. It opens your brain and it allows. So sometimes going for that walk or riding that horse or sweeping the floor or doing whatever is what's going to snap you loose. You can't just sit there in the chair and stare at a blank screen. You can't do that. I I need to do more of what you just spoke about, which is, is listening to yourself. When I dialogue with my unconscious. I'll say, I need to solve this problem and I don't have the answer right now. And now I'll look away from it. I'll go read a book. I'll lie awake with insomnia, whatever. I'll keep chewing on it, and, but I won't do it constantly. I'll come back to it and come back to it and come back to it. And eventually the angle will hit. I'm not so spontaneous that like I'll say, I need to solve this problem right here, right now. I'm willing to wait overnight. But that answer will come. And sometimes you've got to understand creativity is not even. It doesn't flow like a spigot. Some books write really, really easy, that like a house on fire. And other times it's hard. It's really hard. Creativity waxes and wanes depending on your hormone cycle, depending on your time of life, depending on what else is going on, depending on if your brain is tired and just needs a rest. So allowing some spontaneity and realizing it's not a criminal act if you don't get your word count today. The important thing is that you dialogued with the problem and you said, I need to know how to get from here to there. You need to understand how inspiration works. Inspiration is not logical. People make the mistake of thinking you can grind it to death because you have to know all the answers before you start. You absolutely don't. You have to know where you want to land. You'd have to know what answer you want. You need the opening of a scene. You need where you want that scene to land, where you want that character to be. You don't have to give a damn about how you get there. Your subconscious is going to solve that. Inspiration is going to solve that. Your brain is going to do it while you're not looking because subconsciously we are oriented to arriving at solutions. So inspiration is about asking the question and being content to let the process deliver it to you. Because what happens is you focus on where you want to be. Now your brain is going to say, I see this piece and I see that piece and I see that piece and I see that piece over here and it's all going to come together and then it's going to happen. But if you say, I have to know in advance all those steps, well, now you're trying to invent them and you're not letting your brain deliver it. So it's a matter of, again, setting up the agenda and letting your own process solve it. It will solve. And if it doesn't it's because you're fucking bored <laughs> i you know you, you see like the id or, and the super ego i need a janny that's like okay matt you're being a little bitch right now and you need to quit making excuses i've had years <laughs> to understand all this years and years and years and years of experience to say how does this stuff fall out so it doesn't matter if you're a pantser. It doesn't matter if you're a planner. One book may be a pants book. One may, book may be a pan, plan book. Your process could change. You could go through menopause and it can be totally different. And you yeah. better be ready for that because your creativity is going to reinvent. It isn't always going to work the same way. What worked for this book won't necessarily work for that book. If you get so tight and it has to be this way, well, you just clamp down on the best resource which you have which is spontaneity. 
Mm. Creativity is spontaneous. Inspiration is spontaneous. It ignites. So make room for that spark to set a flame to something, but your mind will is a trained dog. It will fetch what you ask it to fetch. So set your goal and then watch your brain align and pull in all the pieces to make that goal happen. They've proven this. They said there was a study done on luck, on people who thought they were lucky or not lucky. And they said, here's a newspaper. It's 50 pages long and there's 28 pictures in this, in this that relate to this subject. Find them all. Okay? The people who thought they were unlucky onerously turned all the pages and missed a batch of them. The people who thought that they had average luck counted them accurately and reached the end. The people who believed they were lucky saw a line on the first page that said, there are X number of images that relate to this in this paper. <laughs> it's a, and it's they didn't a have to look up any of it, okay? So people are constantly setting limits to their own beliefs and it blocks what you're able to see. You're eliminating data because of what you expect. So throw your expectations out and just understand that if you set that goal, if you say, I got a plot hole here I need to fix and I don't know how to fix it yet, surprise me. Mm. Uh, Jim Wilborn, a wonderful indie author. Uh, no matter how much I outline when I'm drafting, something will pop up that's better than my plan. Yep. The mastermind that you're not paying attention is going all the time and it's going 24 seven in the background. And if you let it through, it'll do a better job every time. I wanted to shout out. Thank you so much. Uh, yeah, Montague. That's very, very kind of you. I really, really appreciate that. Um, so shout you out and Matt from go read book, man. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here too. Uh, Jenny, I don't know if you've been here the whole time, Matt, he runs a, a wonderful uh, book two page as well called Go Read Books. And he's one of the guys that started around the same time as me. And that's my buddy. Like, that's my book two buddy. He's he's very honest and he's kind. He's he's a good guy. And uh, I think that, if Matt, if you haven't caught um, previously up to this point, you will 100% value everything that Janny has talked about so far. Uh, it's wonderful to hear. And I love your point about limiting yourself. I think that a lot of times, and I'm guilty of this, we put up these, well, I would, but, or um, I, I'm just not, it's not going to happen for me. Or, and it plays the same with luck. It's a, it's a frame of mind that you put yourself in and it's going to limit you or give you advantages in different ways and different settings and different, um, not, you know, uh, circumstances. And I totally agree with it. Yes, Matt, absolutely. It's wonderful. Um, I did Outward Bound at 16 and a half years old. Um, what is? Uh, Out, the I'm Outward Bound sure. program was developed because in World War II, ships were being wrecked at sea. And the survivors that were coming out of the shipwrecks were often people in their 40s, and many times people in their 20s would die. Mm. And what they figured out when they picked it apart was the people in their 20s too often had not gone through enough hardship or life experience to realize that their limits were more flexible than they thought. They'd never hit rock bottom and stepped past that before. So they would hit what they thought was rock bottom and they would die. Mm. They would give in. So Outward Bound was a 28-day course in its original form designed to tax you far harder than you thought you could withstand. Now, they have since softened the program because they had some deaths, okay? Oh. it was They were not cutting corners with the danger at the time that I went through it. But it was designed to scare you to bits. It was designed to exhaust you past the point where you thought you could not go any further, but you could. And so you learned that your limits didn't exist. They were much more flexible than you believed. And so it shattered your, the glass wall saying you couldn't survive this or couldn't do this or couldn't entertain the idea of stepping past what you thought was not possible. And it also shattered what you believed you could expect from other people. Because you would get a very quick training on, say, repelling, 
and belaying somebody else being repelled. And then suddenly somebody else's life would be in your hands. And if you were the guy hanging off the 200 foot cliff in a basket, because you, you know, they use search and rescue type techniques and your guys up, up there were, who were belaying you screwed up, you were dead. Yeah. Period. So you had to trust that they were able to learn what they needed to know to keep you alive and they weren't going to screw up. So it really taught you to work together, to trust your teammates, also to work to your teammates' strengths and weaknesses mm. and appreciate them. And it taught you to throw your limits out the window because you can hit rock bottom a hundred million times and step right past that. So I think that was a huge experience for me. I paid for it myself. Mm. I wanted the wilderness experience. I thought it was a survival course. I didn't realize it was going to give me a whole changed literally bend my entire philosoph philosophical outlook inside out. But it certainly influenced how I handled my life there forward because people said to me, oh, this can't be done. And I'm going, like, watch me. I love that. And, and I've watched a lot of my buddies go through what I highly respect, and that's the military branches. And that's, that's a lot of what they do. They kind of break you down as an individual and teach you to be a part of a team and go farther than you ever thought you could personally. Outward Bound taught you to be part of a team and to be an extreme individual at the same time, mm. at the same time. And I wish our education system did that, honestly, but it doesn't. It wants you to take the little standard eye test and check the little boxes and be as stupid as you possibly can be and conform and never test your limits, never chase your enthusiasms, do what they consider the bare minimum to get by in this society when your talents may lie in another direction. You might be a supreme champion golfer and never discover that, right? Mm. Yep. What I, what I, the biggest uh, example of what you're speaking of is when I was growing up, it was go to college and you'll graduate. You have a great job that you learned while you were in college and, and then live your life. And a lot of people, you know, I have to say fell for that. Not that college is bad. I think college is a wonderful thing think that there's things that you can go to and be wonderfully successful but there's also a lot of degrees that you get out and you could have spent a hundred thousand dollars on your education and there's nothing available for you and um i have friends in that that situation so it goes to what you were saying about the education system and uh, being told what the right answer is when that isn't for somebody to be telling you that's something as an individual for you to find out I have a college degree, but I didn't go to a traditional college. I went to a college where you contracted your education. You said, here's what I want to do. Here's how I'm going to learn how to do it. I'm going to take uh -huh. these courses. I'm going to read these books. I'm uh -huh. going to go out and do this hands-on experience to show you that I've mastered the material. That college graduates people who understand how to educate themselves because everything you need to know exists in the world. A person has that knowledge, a book has that knowledge, an experience has that knowledge. So that college trained you how to learn. And it's I, not a traditional college, but I doubt I would have survived going through 101, 102, 103. Yeah. Oh, now you discover you really don't want to be in that profession, right? This college let you jump in and at fourth year. And and you could go fourth year anything you wanted, you better pass the exam, but it taught you how to teach yourself to learn. So again, you you learn to craft your own education, you realize you can educate yourself. You don't need a college. You don't need a degree or a piece of paper. But you need to know how to find that knowledge. It goes to something and personal um, opinion on this person is is in the middle for me. I don't go into that kind of stuff on my YouTube channel. But Elon Musk uh, said, you can get a college degree for free. We have Google. It's <laughs> Yeah, right. Google. OK. Well, what, he, what he was saying, though, is anything that you're interested in, whether it be biology or anatomy, 
you don't have to pay a college to learn that. You can learn that on your own. What college is used for is can you do your homework? Will you? Do I would not homework? get it from Google. If I wanted to learn biology, I would go and work with the biologists. Well, I would go and read the books. I would go and read the papers. I would go and get my boots dirty out in the wilderness doing this stuff. There's plenty of opportunities for citizen science. You can do it. In fact, I'm doing it. I'm camera trapping wildlife all the time. The trick is Google isn't going to hand it to you. Google is crap. I would no. go and get the real books and the papers that the true experts have written, not some Dumbo on the internet. I'm sorry, but there's not oh. enough discrimination. No, not a, that's. Not, I don't think it was meant as that way at all. Because I totally agree with you. I think that if you go crazy searching on the internet for answers, you're going to find yourself against a wall. I think the point was doing exactly what you just said. You can find those reliable resources without paying this guy a hundred thousand dollars. You can educate yourself through different means, um, and I, I happen to highly agree with that. And it, it, the trick the is desire, desire, and discipline. So there you go. If you if you have the desire to do it, and that desire is powerful enough, and you have the passion, then you can have the stay at it to go out and find yourself in the position where you can do those things. I mean, you know, you want to go offshore sailing. Mm. Learn how to day sail, and then post. You you find out which ports the small boats are sailing off of and you post up your your little thing saying i want a crew uh -huh. and you will learn hands-on how to do it if you just know basic basic and then you'll build up the resume but you know you've got to talk to the people who do the small boats who go offshore to know where to stick your little card up on the bulletin board right at which time of year do the boats leave for the caribbean from which ports Ooh. Where are the jumping off places? And then you go to those places, stick your card up on the thing. You say your resume, you learn, you know, I took a navigation course. I knew how I to day tell. sail. How did I get to crew all these boats? Because I knew where to stick the card up. You found you, ways. You go to the people, you walk on the dock and you talk to the people who go offshore and you say, how do I do this? Right? Yeah. And that's another thing people are so afraid to do nowadays is to talk to people, ask questions, because if you ask a question, you must be dumb or ignorant or, or, or not intelligent, which is not true. No, you, you find anybody who has a passion for what they do and you can't shut them up, yes. right? Yes. You ask them questions about their preferred field of experience and they can't, they won't shut up. So information is easy to get if your enthusiasm is in sync with where you're chasing it. Absolutely. Totally agree with that. Um, and if you don't subscribe to that, think about something you do really well and how you got there. I guarantee you that process in which you got there led with desire and you finding ways to find each and every problem or um, furthering that hobby that you could. Uh, I, I love that point so much. Um, what was it after all these years of writing that keeps you coming back? Because there's always something that pisses me off or there's <laughs> always something that excites me or there's always something I'm curious about or there's all, you know, there's always something that's going to throw that little piece of sand in, in the pool and it's going to shoot ripples. And you know what? Every idea is not worth writing. Every idea is not worth chasing down and grinding the hours that it takes to create that prose to make it a whole piece or a whole novel or a whole short story. Totally not. I'm pretty choosy. If it can't surprise me, I'm going to get bored and I'm going to walk away from it. If I can predict it, if I can predict it, so can my readers. So there sure. always has to be that insoluble moment in every story or every book where I don't have the answer. And I'm going to write myself right up to the edge of the cliff, literally into ride hellscasm. I lay awake for months. How am I going to solve that scene and do it in not the obvious way that the reader's going to assume is coming? You know the scene I'm talking about. Yes, I was just about to say, this is a book that I will have in my most specialist 
if that's a word, most special of places. Jenny sent this book to me when I had like two subscribers and she had no idea what I really was doing on the channel. She knew I loved fantasy and indie fantasy. Um, and that speaks a lot to what I've become to know Jenny Wirtz as and who I've become to know her as. And it really shows through the conversation we're having. And a lot of those morals that I have, I find that, that we share. Um, it's so cool. And uh, you're somebody that I treasure and so many people do. And I think Jim has an incredible question and Ithra has an incredible topic we'll pop into next. It says, I'd love to know how Janie sees the future of publishing based on her experience in the industry. Hi, yeah, 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 yeah. It has changed so much since I started. It has totally, completely changed, not once, but many times. And the changes are coming faster and faster. And now we're staring right down the gun barrel of AI. Mm. So I sort of see fantasy and science fiction coming full circle because the huge popularity of the genre that's exploded in the last two decades, I mean, it, it's been steadily growing, but it really exploded post 2000, has brought a lot of mainstream attitudes and a lot of mainstream prejudices and garbage and right down our throats. Mm. So the experimental is no longer necessarily welcomed. The individual voice is no longer necessarily welcomed. Even an individual style is no longer necessarily welcomed as it once was. Books are becoming dumbed down, not everywhere. There are lots of really intelligent things being written. And Frankly, I like a dumbed down book now and again, just to escape, to put my mind to sleep, just to escape, you know, to, to lay off the stress. So I'm not knocking those books, any book. I don't ever knock any book. Each book has its purpose. Mm. But when I started, science fiction and fantasy were a niche market. They were just beginning to break out of that niche market with the Valentine fantasy series. I see a return to that. I see the small presses more and more doing what they're doing for the love of it. And I'm going to expect that the really cutting edge styles, the really cutting edge ideas, the really cutting edge books that are not dumbing down to the common denominator are going to see a second life in the niche market, especially if AI gluts the world. It's, I think there will always be that corner, but will it be as lucrative or will it be, will it be what it was before we kind of went off the cliff and said, let's sand off the edges and make, make it more accessible. Mm. I don't believe in more accessibility for everything. I like to see the full gamut. And I, I imagine for myself, I will continue to have my original voice because I'm not going to shut that original voice down for anybody. If I you don't that. like it, you have a choice. Go somewhere else. <laughs> but why can't we have more variety? Why can't we have books that stretch our limits? Why can't mm -hmm. we have books that make us reach? So I value those books. And right now, that's where my value is going to stand strong so I see the niche market re-emerging. Jenny, I hope that you're I right. I don't think we'll ever kill storytelling. I don't think we'll ever kill fantasy and science fiction. But I do see that it may split off from the mainstream again. And I, I really do agree with that uh, based off the little bit that I've, you know, again, four or five years is all I've been a reader uh, that's been passionate about reading. But what I see already is what you know i go to walmart and a lot of these books are the same thing over and over and over and over and over again and then you have publishers that um basically go seeking or trying to structure that from an author um i don't see a lot of variety especially in fantasy when it comes to the big stores if, if you will which are obviously stocked by the big publishing houses and what I do see are these smaller presses, the Broken Binding doing amazing um, things for indie authors and other and traditionally published authors, too. Um, and there's so many other small presses that 
um, let's uh, let's a small publisher, Angry Robots. Uh, they do wonderful things for their authors and uh, for their readers too, and, and they're not these huge huge companies. I think there's maybe twenty authors that write for uh, Angry Robot, and uh, they're it's a, such a special thing. And niching down is becoming pretty popular. Uh, to say I'm just going to review all books doesn't matter the genre. In YouTube, I don't think that would be a successful page. But niching down to what you truly love, you're going to find so many people with the same that relate with that, um, rather than just saying, "Oh, I just want to review everything." Um, and that it's goes becoming right. a question of finding and connecting the individual voice with the readers that appreciate that. And as long as we have all this dogpiling going on, as long as we have, oh, I won't read a book that's rated less than four stars. Well, that just eliminated the books that are polarized. Right? So I really hate what the internet is doing. I hate the algorithm. If I, wouldn't, if I was to destroy one thing about this industry, I would kill the algorithm as fast as I possibly could. And the internet is now being run and suppressed and moved by the algorithm. Too many things are in the way of what you really want to see. Yeah. And so it's going to niche because that's going, word of mouth is going to become more and more important because how else can you deal with getting around what's in your face all the time? You can't see a book that you can't see. Yeah. And if the algorithm is smothering it, which it does, and, Finding and, it is going to be up to the individuals like you running running your live streams. Oh, I love that. And that's that's really what I'm here to do. I just want people to learn and, and find their own way to enjoy this thing called literature. Uh, I have my reasons and I want you to find yours. And if I can help bring authors and talk to you guys and um, aspire to do what you want to do and 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 learn on that that journey and have people along with me. I think that that's very special. And um also what you're doing it's uh to say the least special it's profound um to guys if you how many do you know i'm sure you do the exact number of books that you've had you've published well i think i just kicked out my 20th novel if you include the collaborations with ray 36 short stories 36 i'm not the most prolific author out there but that's because i do everything else yeah and i do my covers I do all of the book. things I do outdoors, which is riding horses. You know, I've done major stuff in music, major, you know, a lot of my life is, is lived in other areas, but also not every idea is worth it. And the ones that I feel are worth it, I'm going to take the time to do them right. And I'm going to take the time to craft them in my own individual way. And I don't always have the privilege of having an editor on board because sometimes I've outlasted the personnel. And sure. when you've been handed around to to editor after editor after editor, they don't they don't relate because they want, they're interested in the people they buy in, or they don't have time to read your giant series and come up to speed. So yeah. pretty much, it's been up to me, and that's been scary but also mm. rewarding because you're getting the pure product as, as best I can make it. Um, so I'm not recommending that people run around and don't, don't get an editor. I wish that I could always have a phenomenal editor on board, but I think the changes are coming so fast and time is so precious and the algorithm is driving things so hard right now. You better be prepared that not everybody that you're working with is going to care about what you do as much as you do. Mm, absolutely. So you that's, might have to learn to wear more than one hat. Oh, that's a, right there. You may have to learn to wear more. I love that because, and I, I, I talk to a lot of people that do that. I never knew that somebody who wrote a book would also have the courage of editing that book. Uh, first, you have to learn what goes into editing, whether it's line developmental. Um, and, and then to do that yourself and cut those 50,000 words, maybe that was part terrifying, of terrifying, terrifying, yeah. but you wonder what, where that extra year went when the draft got finished. Now I do have a copy editor who's phenomenal. 
I've been super lucky to keep the same person on the job. Wow. Um, for the whole series. Yeah. Did the whole series. Um, very, very fortunate there. But as far as the copy I turn out is as clean as I can possibly make it. I wanted their job to be as light as possible. And every time I had a good editor or I had a good, their example taught me, I learned what to look for. So I got better at it as time went on. Um, but one hopes now that the series is done, that the next step, I will have a fantastic editor and that will take me to the next level. I would welcome it. Everybody is so anxious and, and is looking forward to that, especially from you. Um, Ithra, I, I was I promised to get into it. So you are a lover of uh, the equine. You love horses. And Ithra would love to know, what kind of horses do you have? Well, right now I have a horse that I bought off the racetrack. And um, I didn't intend to buy a horse that day, but I knew her bloodline and I knew what I was looking at. She had been horribly abused. Mm. So she came home with me. She's now 31 years old. Wow. And in perfectly good health. I've ridden just about everything I could climb onto since I could climb onto a horse. Um, my specialty would be eventing and jumping and dressage altogether. I did it all. That's incredible. I, and now, now mounted search and rescue. Um, we train our horses to, to scent like dogs do, and they do as good a job as the dogs do. That's something new to me. I did not know that a horse had such a specified um, trait. They can. Like a dog. They can be trained to scent like a dog. Wow. They can find missing persons, and we are training ours to also to cadaver search for recoveries. And they're good at it. They're super good at it. It's just people underestimate what, what they can do. Sure. I can see how that would be a part of it because me, I had no ideas that, that, that a horse could be used for such things. But I have to say, I, I've watched quite a few examples, especially for missing people. Um, these people who have been missing for maybe a couple years, you know, a longer amount of time in the search and rescue uh, that finds them a lot of the time, maybe in a pond uh, and their car who just was never found. Mm -hmm. But what I'm trying to say is those type of um, meaningful jobs and, and what you're training your horses to do mean to people so much. If they do. Yeah. The recovery, sometimes we work cold cases that are 30 years old. Yeah. Um, but the families want closure. Mm, of course. They it's want closure. And in many cases they can't solve what happened unless there's a body. Mm. So, and you know, we, we are, highly trained for emergency and disaster training. We were sent across to the Bahamas after Dorian to help with recovery there. Ooh, yeah. And honestly, the people were so grateful that we were there, but I felt they gave us more than we were giving them. Oh, wow. How do you mean? Always. They always the humanity that they show towards the people who are helping them. Mm. It's humbling because Very. I don't feel we're doing that much, but what they give us back in, in their, in their gratitude and in the way we're treated or the way we're regarded or the respect that we're shown is always overwhelming. What a relationship to have with somebody based just on humility and, um, gratefulness and kindness and the, that human side that we all can relate with. If we really search for it, here are these people, they've lost everything. Mm. You know, literally the storm came in It had a 28 foot storm surge. They had 180 mile an hour winds and it parked over them for three days. Whole communities were wiped out. And the kindness that they show us and what they give back when they have nothing, their houses are flattened. Mm. Um, the willingness to, to give us information, the willingness to give us what resources they have to help. It just, it, it's, it's humbling. It's the only thing I can say is that people are not as selfish as people assume. I people pull together in a disaster. They usually don't attack each other. So this 
false notion of the grimdark novel where dog eats dog. That's not the way the natural world works. The natural world is cooperative mm. and collaborative. And maybe it takes a rough moment to make that come out, to it pull does. people out of their shells and make them show the heart that they truly have. But I honestly believe the world is a kinder place than people give it credit for. Think about 9-11. And I know you have a relationship with that date with this book. Um, it, it, before 9-11 happened, the world was this way. After, Americans and, and people worldwide were just, they were like, we're in a time where we all need each other and everybody pulled together. So I think oftentimes it, it, it requires that bit of hard times or terrible things to happen for us to be reminded, um, hey, we're all here together. We go through very similar things each day. We all bleed red. And doing the service you do with um, the, the horses is just a huge part of that. Um, would you touch a little bit on when this book was uh, published and kind of what happened in that, that frame of time? I wrote the book after I wrote Peril's Gate in the main series, which for people in the main series, Peril's Gate was harrowing emotionally. It is the tipping point of the series. It is the moment where the transcendence begins to unfold. It is the rock bottom examination of what one character in particular went through or and coming to reckoning, coming to that moment of self-reckoning. So that book just wiped me completely off the map. My career had crashed. I was going through menopause. My U.S. publisher had merged and all of the people from my half of HarperCollins half were disowned. Avon and HarperCollins merged. So nobody survived that from the, the HarperCollins side. Um, they cut the list. And so I had a clamoring of people, the internet, everything was descending on me saying, worse has lost control as a series. She's never going to finish it. She has no clue what she's doing because I knew exactly what I was doing, but not enough was on the ground to prove it yet. Okay. Peril's Gate had not been released. So I needed the emotional break. I never meant to write the series end, 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 but that's what had to happen because of the way publishing ran. So I took the time off to write a standalone and say, look, I can write an epic fantasy and it can be one book, five and a half day plot, one and done. And it can be ever bit as powerful as a major series. Some fiction is meant to be a short story. Some is meant to be a novella. Some is meant to be a single novel. And some is, can be a long form work that's 11 books or whatever. Yeah. The story dictates what, what the author is trying to do dictates the length of the story. So I'm not one of these people. Oh, yeah, I got that uh, accusation. I'm just dragging it out for the money, which was no, I was dragging out my poverty to get it finished. Okay. Um, so I wrote to ride House Chasm and the book just took off like a shot. Once I wrote the first chapter, it just wrote like a house on fire. And halfway through it, 9-11 happened and the whole world went into a tailspin. Everything stopped. I couldn't write for two weeks. It was horrific what happened. Oh. It changed everything. Some things for the better. Many things now, the after fall fallout is for the worse. But what it did was it totally shocked the publishing world and it froze book buying and it froze everything for two years. Publishers stopped buying. People stopped reading because they said, we need to pay attention to what's real in our lives, like our families. Mm. We need to you know, stop living the fiction that everything is fine. We need to pay attention to the real world. And we don't know, certain Western countries were thinking, we don't know if we're going to be going to war. Yeah. So bookshops stopped stocking, publishers stopped buying, everything just, the reverberation ripple lasted for about two years. And that was right at the moment when my contract also had done, died. Mm -hmm. So in the US, I had no publisher and I had no publisher coming on in the UK. Everything created the perfect storm at that moment in my career because Hell's Chasm was supposed to revitalize and gain me 
another contract in the USA, but nobody was looking at books. They all, all the editors refused to look. They didn't even want to see the book. Sorry, we don't want to read it. The one editor who wanted it was going through another merger and she hung on to it two years. And then she said, I'm sorry, I've kept it too long. I feel guilty. I wanted to buy it, but I better turn it back to you. Mm. My British agent had gotten diabetes and had a foot amputated and forgot to submit my next book to my UK publisher. Mm. So I thought my career was over as far as traditional publishing was going. And at this time, there was no self-publishing option. There was sure. nothing. So menopause, 9-11, publishers freezing, no editor in the US who even wants to take a look at this book because nobody's buying. My UK agent, I assume, was uninterested, but I didn't know that my British agent had not submitted. Yeah. So I went into a screaming depression and I was having insomnia like you couldn't believe. I was getting a hot flash every 15 minutes. It was a horrible Ooh. moment of my life. So Hell's Chasm came out because I signed with an independent press just to hold the place so that my readers could find me because the algorithm at the time said, if you didn't publish a book every two years, your previous record was erased and you may as well just start over. And I couldn't change my name because I was in the middle of a series. Mm -hmm. So the depression was just overwhelming me, but nobody saw it because Outward Bound taught me you just keep going. You keep searching for that solution. You keep finding your way until something pops. So I wasn't going to quit. I said, I'll just keep writing books and there'll be a stack of books sitting on the floor here when I'm 90. And that's that. I'll at least have done my job. If the world didn't agree with me, too bad for the world, right? So mm -hmm. this went on until finally I asked my British editor, I guess you don't want my books. And she said, what do you mean? We don't want your books. She said, your agent never submitted them. We thought you were stopping to write. We, you were quitting writing. And I said, what the F? Sure. So that's when I began to see about signing the rest of the series with the British publisher. And I got, that's where I lost my audio rights. That's why I lost my e-rights because I had to give up some stuff to get the other five books under contract in the UK. So I signed on that figuring that's going to give me the incentive to get this whole monster series finished. I will sign the contract. I'll sign that dotted line. And even if it's crappy money, whatever it is, I will just finish it. And at that time, that's when my brain began to say, how can I get this distributed in the U S? So I had to wait for a long period to get the rights to revert because the books were still in print and I had to wait for the reversion clause. And then I had to wait for two years with them going out of print so I could get all the rights together. And then I had to resell for a, a world deal with the UK. So again, it wasn't on the terms that I would have preferred, but it was the terms that were going to get the job done. Mm. So I said, I'm not going to die with this series unfinished. It's too important. It's taken too much of my life and I'm damn well going to finish this idea. Yes. So I just did what my college taught me to do, which was find a way to make it work. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't necessarily the best way. It wasn't necessarily the most lucrative way. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> no, it wasn't necessarily the way that was going to build me fame and fortune because you're always tied to your advance size. However, the series is finished. I couldn't possibly be more happy with the way it finished out. You That's will see in May exactly what I was striking to do when I wrote page one, because this series was definitely well-planned. I was planned it for 30 years before volume one was even published. So I knew exactly what I was doing all along. So Hell's Chasm sadly fell through the cracks because it hit that gap in the 9-11. So it, it was the book that was supposed to restart my readership. It was supposed to bring the Empire readers over to the big series. It was supposed to be that bridge. It completely fell into oblivion. And if it's being discovered right now, it's because of a bunch of YouTubers like you who are bringing it into prominence because it, it utterly disappeared. I remember getting the email where you told me uh, a much more summed up version of that story. And I just found myself being 
well, what I thought was inspired, but after hearing the entire story, I'm just incredibly inspired by it. And what I mean by that specifically is the tenacity. Somebody, yes, somebody, uh, Ithra said that her tenacity is epic. Uh, to go through, you know, as a country, a hard time, but also what an incredibly hard time that was for you in your life and what you did to overcome it, despite of all those things stacked against you. I don't think. Am I going to let circumstances like 9-11, like misfortune, like publishing, like algorithm, like sales figures, like computer tracking that screws things up and takes things off auto reorder because they went out of print too fast. And then auto reorder says, you didn't have any sales for four months. We're dropping this title off the chains. I'm telling you, the ways to trip your career in this industry are a million strong. And the choice came down to, am I going to let this silence me or am I going to do what I was born to do? There and is. only I was the one who could say I quit. You are the only one that can say you quit. And what do you have to lose? If the world grinds you down and you die in obscurity, that's a whole lot better than saying I give up, <laughs> right? Any day. Any day. I love that. And that's 100% um, something I find I want to be more like as a person, uh, somebody who would take a problem like what you had to take and, and overcome it using, uh, well, your love, your passion, what you needed to do, what you wanted the end result to be. And, and you're there. And you know what? God bless my mother. She's gone now, but Everything I wanted to do kind of went against the grain of what she thought was best for me. All of it. All of it. And I said, nope, 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 not buying into this. So I kind of had to live with that sandpaper all my life of you're not do you're not living the correct life here. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. You're not going. God bless my mother. She taught me to be tenacious. She taught me to listen to myself and she taught me pretty much to erect that barrier that said against all comers, I will do this because that's what my heart says I should be doing. That message will not go unnoticed through this conversation for those who watch it in the future. So it's something they will some, take. I had, I had parents that supported me immensely by saying, show me the responsible way you can do what you want. But I also had tremendous resistance to living the independent lifestyle that I chose to live. I didn't get married till 38. Mm -hmm. I chose not to have children. So against the grain, against the grain, against the grain for what my mother thought was best for me. So often an adversarial relation with your family can be a gift. They mean well. My mother wanted me to be safe and happy. And that was the only path she saw for me being safe and happy. And honestly, for women, there weren't a lot of options when I went to college. There weren't a lot of options. It was just beginning to open up because, frankly, reproductive freedom hit the map. The pill was yep. invented and it hit the map. So women were no longer forced to give up if they didn't want to. So she didn't come from that lifestyle. She couldn't understand it. That adversarial stance I had to take to win through and win past that was a gift. So your parents mean well for you, but sometimes when you don't have the family you wish for, that can be that grain of sand can be what makes you strong. So many, uh, so many different points in this conversation. You've said profound things like that. And, and Jim really sums it up here. Hell yeah, Janny. There it is. Love that. Skef Ryan Skepton, love you, mom. Everybody, yeah, we're thinking about our mothers. Of course we are. After that story, all right, Snow, mom. And um, yeah, Montague, I dig strong women. Nanny, uh, well, I'm sure he meant Janny, uh, is a strong woman. Absolutely. Of course he did, brother. I got you. Um, <laughs> Autocorrect. <laughs> Damn the algorithm. Squish yeah. it. <laughs> I turn mine off. I won't use that. I can't stand it drives me absolutely wild. I'm sitting here writing along and it gives me a little red squiggle under the world. I'm like, go to hell. You're done. Switch it off. <laughs> or like you hit the space bar or, uh, on your phone and it changes the word automatically. Like, no, I promise I'm coherent and sentient and understand what I'm trying to spell. And you correct me as it. Yeah, it's very annoying. 
I love that uh, we all have that similar feeling towards autocorrect. I think people, um, I don't think I've ever heard somebody be like, oh, you know, I just really enjoy the autocorrect. We need to sign up. <laughs> so what are, so I know this is, uh, what's coming up for you? What are you kind of working on in the moment and what's, what's next for you? I know the answer to this, but kind of let everybody know what's coming up for you. I get to choose anything I want. And what I want is to continue to do short works on my own, no publisher in the Ethereum universe. I will do it myself because there are certain things in that back history. The back history is so immense, the readers have no idea. There is so much material. So I want to experiment and play with that. Maybe some epic poetry. I don't know. But that's going to be my hobby stuff. That's going to be for fun. As far as the next novel, expect that I will write standalones. Expect that they will be not set in my major world or universe. Just as my other standalones are, they will be standalones. They will not be connected to anything else because I want to try some new waters and I don't like being bored. Sure. So I have a, a standalone novel already four chapters down that I wrote when I was screaming crashed and thought I'd never be able to get a contract for the series. So I started something else. I may also try thrillers. Ooh. I got the background for it. Yeah. With all this search and rescue and the I contacts I have in law enforcement. A search and rescue thriller. Oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and why not mix a little bit of crazy into that too? Because they really hate people who who like fantasy. You know, they call them what do they call them? Um, the nuts, the fruits, and the loops. Oh gosh, <laughs> that's the exact opposite yep. impression. So I you know, yeah, exactly. There could be a real good clash here. So I don't know. I might try my hand at something else. It depends. It where my heart steers me. Right now, I have two major deadlines on my plate that I have to finish before I can tackle those projects and really have my come to Jesus moment mm. um, with so, my option clause with the publisher yeah. that I'm done the contract for. So anything goes, a lot will be determined by how well the series finishes is received. So because, that, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. No, that's all right. I was that just uh, curious. Um, I know the answer, but, when will the series come to a conclusion? When will that last book be out? May 28th. There was some dispute on that, that the the release date might be staggered between the U.S. and the U.K. No, no. It will be May 28th. Same here day. Here and there. It was always designed to be that way, and there was sort of an editor change, and things hit a blip where they added four more. The, the books are printed in, in the UK and they come over to the US by container ship and it takes four months to stock the shelves. So they accidentally added four more months to the UK release thinking there wasn't enough time. And I'm going, production is already happening. They're going to press now. You've got the four months to simultaneously release this. What's going on? So it took a little course correct to get that back on the map. So it is coming out in May. And if you're having trouble getting the books, it's because of the distribution glitch where they sell out and yeah. they don't send enough across and it takes four months to restock the shelves. So please be persistent, scream and yell, cry blue murder, let the publisher know you can't get the books because I can't convince them to stock the books strong enough to last when somebody like you does a live stream, then of course people go look for the book. Yeah. And if there aren't enough stock in the shelf, it takes a while to reset. So the eBooks should be readily available. Um, Tori, Tori Tekken popped in and she's another one. I wanted to make sure that I threw it up there talking about uh, this wonderful standalone um, to ride Hills chasm. And Tori, if you didn't catch what was uh, said before you popped in right here, uh, the story behind To Ride Hell's Chasm is, is absolutely amazing. And um, uh, Janie talks about how people doing what we do, Tori, talking about her standalone To Ride Hell's Chasm and has really made a, a big change in uh, people reading it. So uh, wonderful story behind it. And you should absolutely check that out if you missed it. It's absolutely wonderful. I owe everything to the book community 
and to the people who love the books and have the enthusiasm to spread the word because this is a cutthroat business. It is the entertainment business. You're only as good as your sales figures from the last book. And when a merger happens and glitches happen Ooh. and book um, the death, bookstore death spiral kicks in, there's no way you claw out of it other than word of mouth. And for years and years and years and years, my big series has had zero support beyond, yeah, we print this and we put it out there. Mm. So if it gets anywhere, it is because of the strength and the grace and the enthusiasm and the selfless, loving dedication of the science fiction and fantasy community that love books because it's, they are the ones who are making this happen. One of my favorite booktube channels before uh, starting my own and still is uh, Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews. Um, did a review of your book and he's got a really, really big channel. I was so happy to say, and he loved it. I remember him uh, talking about how much he loved it and he's got quite the following and I hope to be there one day. Um, but it was such a nice, refreshing thing for me to see um, a deserving author with wonderful prose, wonderful work ethic, wonderful books uh, to be shouted out about and more people I hear every single day talking about your work and it just makes me smile. Um, well, they can always ask me to have a mail them a copy too it's because I, the, the small press that did that book that you were holding went under owing me five figures. Oh my gosh. And what I found out was that they stiffed the warehouse that had the books in them and they literally unlocked the doors and walked away. Wow. And there were trucks going to pull up the next day to take all those books to the landfill. Oh my gosh. And this was eight hours away. And we called our friends who were pirate reenactors because we go out yes. with the pirates. Yeah. Yeah. We fire cannons. We do Let's all that stuff. Do it. Yes. We called them up and one of them knew somebody who do a, a semi who drove a semi and he pulled up and rescued the books and they got parked in a friend's basement. And then I negotiated with the defunct publisher who owed me five figures to sign me the stock. So I owned it officially. It wasn't going to get taken to the landfill or swept. So officially I owned the books. So I have a lot of copies of these books. Sure. Um, that I won't ever see the remuneration for, you know, I will sell them at little tables at conventions here and there, but I've certainly got plenty of copies. So if there are reviewers out there that really enjoy individual style and don't mind a book that makes you think, i yeah. happy. In the to... most wonderful way. Um, so yeah, it's, it's sort of funny. Again, you have to make lemonade when, when life hits you with a, with a whopper, you turn it. So and you find uh, a way to make it work for you. Jim. Yes. So uh, she has these, books personally. And, and so you're saying this book right here went through that journey. You just, it did. Up. It did. I have hardbacks and I have trade paperbacks. I am allowed officially to sell them personally. It doesn't fall under my complete non-compete clause with Harper Collins who has it in print and paperback provided that I don't sell them for more than what their paperback sells for. I love, so, the you know, insight. I don't under, I don't undercut there so I can sell them. And because they're hardback and trade and they only have the paperback, we're good. So um, yeah, you can buy one. Just send me an email. My email is very public. It's easy to find on my website. Absolutely. That is wonderful. Just another example of this community guys. And how do you think my jaw was when I opened this and I will forever have a Janny words autograph personalized book on my bookshelf that I can look at and just go, Today's going to be all right. And Misha Merlin used acid-free paper. They got the Library of Congress's um, best rating for longevity. That book is guaranteed yeah. to last for 200 years. It's not discolored. Uh, nothing. So it's seriously well-made book. It's a seriously beautifully made book. It's not going to fall apart on you. It's not going to yellow. It's not going to. Nope. And not only that, and everybody knows this now, but just and you get to read it and then you get to look at the wonderful cover and the, the back and just know that Janie put all that love and, and talent into it. Um, oh, there he is, my man. 
Uh, we were just talking about you, brother. I'm sure you heard if you were here. Um, I was talking about your review of her book. Uh, yes, Jenny, I recently read Hell's Chasm and quite liked I, I literally was just telling her this story, Matt, um, of your, your review. Uh, but I ended up a bit disappointed because the cover kind of ruins a surprise that I wished I found out on my own. Whose decision was the cover? <laughs> Mine. Blame me. Blame me. Because it was entirely my production start to finish. Um, so I'm sorry you felt it ruined it. To me, the journey is as much a part of that book as the destination. And a lot of the points I was trying to make was about how that journey was completed and about how the characters changed in the process and about prejudice and about how it can color our opinions and about how people who are prejudiced against have to constantly fight that undertow. So perhaps for you, the destination was more important than what I thought the story was really about because each person brings their own self and their own makeup to a story. So really that alchemy makes that story their own story in their own way. So in your case, it spoiled the ending for you because your values were not quite in alignment with what I thought was important. So this happens with the book. It twists you out of your alignment and sometimes it agrees with you and sometimes it doesn't. So I'm sorry you feel the cover gave away the ending. The British cover probably doesn't, um, or at least the British paperback cover probably doesn't. I wish you'd been my consultant at the time I was coming up with the image. Perhaps it go. could have been done in a way that would have pleased both of us. Um, but um, I don't hold it against any reviewer having an opinion that doesn't agree with my book because I understand their review isn't really about me or the book. It's about the person who read it yes. and how they reacted. Oh, and he loved the book. You should go back and check his review out on his channel. It's He absolutely thought it was a wonderful book. Um, I think it was just what one little aspect because he had the most wonderful things to say about it. Um, thanks for popping in here, brother. Yeah, and thank you for coming, Matt. And I, I don't even mind reviewers who hate my book. Go ahead. Vent that hate because what you hate, somebody else might love. I've a book a is going to die if it's not talked about at all. I've had a review from a good friend of mine talk me into my favorite top two favorite of uh, indie books last year. Um, his negative review, the reasons he found the, to be a negative um, book for him, talks me into one of my favorite reads. Uh, so that is 100% true. Um, and Matt says, uh, yeah, great point. I did like the book and cannot wait to read the Empire Trilogy after I read A Darkness at Sethanon. Okay, well, you'll be in for a surprise. I hope you enjoy it. All right. And if you don't, no worries, because the review is about the reviewer. It totally is their thing. Um, once the book is out in the world, I can't change it anyway. So I let it go and go on to the next one. Uh, Matt, by the way, man, if, if anybody that's here now uh, missed the rest of the, the interview, there's been some very profound stories and, and morals and, and parts of the story that just really captivated me and so many others, I'm sure of it. Um, so the end of the series is coming up. That's exciting. That's something you've obviously been uh, after. Um, this is your, your big goal, a, a goal that at certain points in your story you didn't see happening. You didn't know how it was going to happen, but you've made it. You're here. And that comes again. It's May. May 28th. May 28th. Um, that's so exciting. Can be uh, pre-ordered right now, and pre-orders will certainly determine how much enthusiasm the publisher will put behind the launch. Guys, that's one link. I thought I covered them all. I didn't. Of course, I forgot the, the pre-order link. Uh, I will have that in the description right after we're done talking. Um, I'll add that. The rest of her list. So your website goes into a lot of detail in all you all of your series and then this huge list of short stories you've got so much that you've written um it's it's fun for people like me who have just a taste and, and i get a, a, to look forward to all these wonderful 
novels, short stories um, of your work. So I'm very excited about that. If you guys want to find out more um, about what she's done in the past, uh, wonderful website. Let's see here. Uh, I have to thank Brian Yuri who designed that thing start to finish. He's done a phenomenal job because there's no way I would have had time to make that website what it is without uh, his help. Anything you need, it's there. Uh, Brian there also wrote the entire Wikipedia for, for the Paravian universe. Oh, wow. Monster project. It took him years, but he's done a phenomenal job and he will have a wiki up for the final volume, but he's going to wait till it's out in the world. So nothing gets spoiled. All right. Well, congrats to that and, and great job. And, um, oh, yes, yeah, sorry, Ithra, I'm glad you reiterated that. Is there an audio to um, Hell's Chasm? No, there is not. And I don't have the rights. Otherwise, there would be. I have five books in audio under my own name, plus the three books that I collaborated with Ray Feist. They're all in audio. Those are the ones I had the rights to. I do not have the rights for the big series, and I do not have the rights for Hell's Chasm. That's part of the trade-off to get the contract to finish it. So if you want the audio, make those numbers happen and scream and yell and pound the desk and tell the people at HarperCollins Voyager UK, not US, that you want it because I can't do any more than I've done. I would love to have an audio. I would absolutely die to have an audio. Sure. Um I, 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 sh I know I wanted to talk about it a little bit, and I know that it's... However, you can go and listen to three chapters of... The opening three chapters of To Ride Hell's Chasm is downloadable M3Ps right off my website as an MP3 file. I did those myself. I'm not a narrator. I'm not an actor. It's going to be flat narration, but it's clean because I use GarageBand. So that's the best I can do for that book right now. But we can hope that something will happen in the future. Yes, just more people talking about the book. And um, how was it to write with the legend uh, Raymond Feist? It was crazy because I didn't want to do it. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> Ray had this idea and he had the beginning opening thought of, you know, this woman being pulled out of what amounts to a nunnery and inheriting the rulership of her house against huge enemies. And he had an idea of, and she becomes servant of the empire. Nothing in between. And he said, I don't want to write a woman. Uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to do this job by myself. I want you to collaborate. Cause he'd read sorcerer's legacy that had a very strong, but feminine heroine. She's not a sword wielding Goliath. She's just a woman. She's a widow. And he picked on me for two years. And I was like, no, 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 Ray. I got the Wars and Light Shadows. I'm I'm working on that. That's that's gonna be my big epic. I got a couple of smaller contracts to finish first because I was working on my fourth novel at the time. I don't want to do this. I don't want to do this. Not at all. I don't want to do it. I'll give you all the ideas. I will beta read for you. I will read, make sure that you write the women the way you want them. You know, I'll make sure that, that your female character stands up, but I don't want to do this. Well, he kept picking on me and he kept picking on me and he kept picking on me. And he finally won me over because I realized how much Machiavellian fun it was going to be to collaborate with him to invent the system, which was the great game of the council and to help and be there and make the Tarani culture be as brilliantly crazy as it is. And I had just come back from Korea. So oh, I wow. had visited Asia and I said, Oh my God, there are so many mismatches between that culture and the culture I grew up in that we can really play off of this to give you an idea I went over to visit a friend of mine who was an animator at the time. And he was married to a Korean woman who's a lovely person, Kyung. They're still married today. And he wanted her to 
be able to develop her English, and he wanted one artist that he knew from the United States to understand the crazy world that he'd entered because the culture was so crazily different. Yeah. So I get to Korea, and John says to me, I need you to help me solve a problem with my wife. And I'm going, don't, don't turn me into a marriage counselor here. I'm not this. And he said, no, it's not that. He said, I don't understand. I, I see her admire something like a piece of jewelry and I give it to her as a gift and she puts it in a drawer and she never wears it, she never touches it. And he said, I can't tell if she's playing me for one or what's going on or if she really hates it. I don't know what she's thinking. So Kion was traveling with me. She took me all over her country. I got to see things, length and breadth of Korea that I would never have gotten to see. Wow. So one day I sat down and I had a chat with her and I said, Kion, in this broken English, because she could barely speak English at all, why when John gives you a gift, do you put it in a drawer and never ever take it out of the drawer? And she looked at me like I was crazy. And I said, Kyung, if in the United States, if a man gives you a gift or a piece of jewelry or a piece of clothing and you don't wear it, it means you don't like him. And you think the gift is ugly. And she goes, really? <laughs> <laughs> well, then she explains to me in her culture, if a man gives you a gift, and you tre truly treasure it, you might wear it once in your life. Wow. And that says how much you value it, that you value it. And if you never wear it, if you keep it in the original wrapping and you put it in a drawer, it's too precious to wear. And that is how much you value it. The cultures were 180 degrees. A war could start over a misunderstanding like that. Sure. And so that's another thing that gets put into my writing all the time is cultural misunderstandings can totally screw up everything because everybody's running on assumptions. Ooh, that's so that deep. became huge in the Wars of Light and Shadow. It became huge in the Sarani culture. So I said to Ray, all right, I quit. I'll do this. And I caved. And we did this. And it was phenomenal. And we had our moments where we were outlining and planning things like a house on fire. It was literally a match made in heaven for generating ideas until we hit an impasse. And then we would knock heads. And then we would come up with a third direction to go, which was always better than what he wanted or I wanted. So it was a huge lesson in human interaction to say, when you can't agree on something, there's always a better solution. There's a third way. Mm -hmm. And if you're patient enough, you'll come up with it. And if you listen enough, and you let your intuition close the gap and spark an idea, you can come up with something totally different that neither one of you understood wow. and it can make the project better. So that is how the empire came out. And the only regret that I have ever is that many people bounce off my solo work because they think it's going to be just like the empire and it totally isn't. Ray's voice is his voice. My voice is my voice. The blend worked out very well and we each excel in our own arena. Mm. But I regret the readers that aren't flexible enough to mm. stretch that one step further or who never tried it because they assume, well, the empire is all there is because she didn't collaborate with a man here. I don't know. It's, a, it's one of life's mysteries. Ray so, knew what he wanted. Whatever. But he got his way and I will never regret it. Absolutely never regret it. That sounds incredible. Yeah, he knew what he wanted. And then you got to be a part of this whole nother aspect that, that has influenced you deeply. I, I sense that. It changed both of us. That is incredible to come through a, a writing, which is where it started. It definitely didn't end up that way. So many more aspects to that story. I did not expect that. That is wonderful. Um, thank you for sharing everything that you've shared. It's very uh, special to me. And uh, so many people do, Josh. Josh Eats Books says, Janie, I admire your artwork uh, for your books. Absolutely. It's wonderful. Um, Thank so, you. 
I love what's coming up for you. I've loved this conversation. Lastly, Janie, I would just like to thank you. And this will absolutely not be the last time I would love to speak with you on my channel. Um, I will probably be like, hey, when's the next time? So I'm looking forward to that. But I've just had such a wonderful time. I've learned so much. I have so much to, to go back and rewatch and, and pay more attention to certain parts. So just thank you for letting me borrow you for a little bit. Thank you for the privilege of your time. And thank your listeners for being here. Because I really feel like age is just a number. And it's really nice to be an old hand in this field and be able to reach out to the entire community, young, old, crazy, eight to 80, because we're all one big family in the end. And we wouldn't be here without each other. Mm. So anything Absolutely. that I can do to bring us together and to pass on what I know and to learn from other people who are just starting out and that enthusiasm is so very fresh, it's a privilege. It's honestly a privilege to have very, your time and attention very much uh speaks to why i started this and it just it's, it's absolutely perfect so again thank you so much janny this has been an, a quite the experience thank you wonderful people for uh, one of the best chats that i've seen in quite some time um and for those who will watch in the future uh thank you as well and I have to always say the YouTube stuff, like, share, subscribe. That always helps um, me and more important to me, the authors that I have on. The more people that get to watch Janny talk about her experience, the more people that will find their love for her work. Um, and tomorrow I am speaking with Adrian Tchaikovsky. He, oh, um, I love his work. He's a uh, brilliant, unpredictable writer, just an expansive imagination. Adrian's uh, work is just stunning. The way he brings evolution with bugs and arachnids and all these wonderful things that you know he's I am mean, shadow of the app, just lots of insects that he found from you know his inspiration from. So uh oh, lots and of the way he can take the character and grind them against their own ideology and their conscience and just that that rub that changes the unpredictability of which way they're going to jump. He's excellent at really digging into the depths of human nature mm. and, and characters who are thinking too broadly for their culture I and in pain that. because of it. So there's a lot to be said about Adrian's work, though I will never ever to my dying day forgive him for what he did for Tisamon. <laughs> I, what he did to Tisamon, uh-uh, Adrian, uh -oh. you're on my bad list. I will never forget. And that's a tribute to the brilliance of the way that character was written. It has to be, to have that sort of feeling and emotion behind it. Wow. All right. Unforgettable books are to be treasured. I will share that with him, and I'm, I'm very excited. So, uh, everybody, thank you for being here. Janny, thank you so much again, and we will see you guys tomorrow night. Thank you, Matt, and may your channel grow by leaps and bounds. Thank you.